there. Like, can a gas a bapathy? Like, if all of you can remember like 2,000 different team numbers and team names, you can do seven syllables, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, you can definitely. Who's, who said I'm not that smart? Come on. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. All right, folks, let's start this over again. We are going live. Welcome to Effective First Strategies. Uh, I am very excited because this year marks the 20th year of me giving this presentation. This presentation first started in the fall of that place earlier. It's kind of an incubator for a lot of different successes and especially incubator of successes in first. Uh, a lot of the top first teams in Ontario and in Southern California all have mentors from the University of Waterloo. It's a great school if you want to think about that. Uh, my first journey has been a, a great one for, you know, it, I have a lot of different things that I've done. Mainly, I was the lead mentor for Team 1114 for 2004 to 2016. Uh, we won some stuff there. We'll talk a lot about EPA and OPR or whatever, but you will see that some years we, we broke the charts for those sorts of things. Why? because we follow the rules in this presentation. Um, I was fortunate enough to give a TED talk uh, a while ago, and that TED talk was actually based on this presentation. I just took out a lot of the robot stuff and just distilled the opening of that. Uh, I suggest you check that out, but also I'm gonna give you like a little bit of synopsis of that in a slide or two. Um, I've done some other random esoteric things like hosting robot competitions on ESPN, filming an episode of Degrassi with Drake. Uh, Drake and I are boys. The way it worked out was I saw Drake on set and I nodded my head. He nodded his head back at me and basically that means we're best friends, you know? So like, I'm in his list. I was not in his diss track that he dropped a couple days ago. That means, you know, like, I'm clearly his bestie or whatever like that. So I'm just, you know, waiting for the invite to the courtside seats of the Raptors game and then we'll be good. Uh, now I am lucky to have one of the best jobs in the world. I am the Director of Programs and Strategy for First Canada, so I get to do robots and do fun stuff for all of you, especially the Canadians in the audience, so that is really cool. Uh, yeah, 20 years, things change in 20 years. Um, I had a lot more hair back then than I do now. That is a change, um, but a lot of things don't change, and this presentation has remained pretty similar over the years. How does that work? It's the same way that your calculus textbook probably hasn't changed too much. There are some rules that are established and that just apply. So as first has gone from two-on-two -two matches, yes, when this presentation started, it was two-on-two. -two. As alliance selection has switched, because before it wasn't one through eight, eight through one, it was one through eight, one through eight. Uh, as ranking points have been introduced, as new stats have been introduced, this stuff stays the same. And I'm probably the thing that I'm most proud of of this presentation. This presentation is being seen by, if you go by what YouTube's saying, over 100,000 people over the past 20 years, which is pretty wild to think about. And a lot of teams attribute their success to this, you know? So who knows, maybe it'll be good for you too. Uh, here's what we're talking about, folks, and maybe we'll cover it all today. Probably not, but I definitely want to get through everything from strategic design and scouting. Uh, I think a lot of you are here to talk about the scouting session because I'm going to be talking specifically about what it takes to get on a playoff alliance here at the championship event. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of good teams at this event. There are 600 teams at this event. Only 256 will be making the playoffs. I think there are probably 400 playoff quality teams here. That means 144, that's 12 squared, playoff quality teams will not make the playoffs. I want all of you to prepare for this, because if you don't make the playoffs, that is not a determiner of your season. Do not judge your season on that, even if that was the goal. There are so many good teams. When we get to the stats part, there is just this clump of teams in every division that are probably ranked 12th to about 40th that are averaging around eight, nine teleop game pieces a match, depending on how you look at that. Those number and all of you, have to make the tough decision on who is being picked for alliances. And we'll talk a lot about how that one's gonna work. Um, to start things off, I think of this presentation as being more than just a presentation about robots, but I think what you apply in this presentation to the world of FIRST Robotics can be applied to your life. And so these are quotes that I like to live by. This was the basis of that TED Talk I was telling you about. So let's jump into this and see how this applies to the real world, how this applies to robots. Enthusiasm is one of the most powerful engines of success. When you do a thing, do it with all your might. 
Put your whole soul into it. Stamp it with your own personality. Be active, be energetic, be enthusiastic and faithful, and you will accomplish your object. Nothing great ever, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. This is a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was also the cover page of the course notes from the course that Dr. Woody Flowers used to teach at MIT. Why does this quote matter? Folks, in your life, you will eventually, some of you are already there, will go to the work world. And you will be spending 40 hours out of your 168 hour week doing something. And your life will be so much more fulfilling if you enjoy what you do. I know plenty of adults who work is just something that they get through. And that's no way to live your life. And guess what, folks? You have the power to control that, especially right now, if you can find what you're passionate about. But even more so, if you want to do well at something, so let's consider two people, two accountants. Actually, let's do, how many programmers do we have in the room? <sighs> okay. No, but like programmers are a really strange breed. Most of them love programming, absolutely do. So if you have a programmer who loves programming, when they get a job, they're gonna work their 40 hours a week, but they don't mind doing some extra time coding because that's what they do. And then when they get home, they're gonna be working on their own personal projects on their GitLab and learning new skills and playing around, you know, and picking up other skills. Well, there'll be some people who are coding just because their parents said, hey, you can make a lot of money, go be a programmer. Or some guidance counselor told them, oh, you're good at math, go be a programmer. But they don't love it. So 40 hours a week is like, when the week ends, they are gone. And they're not coding, which is their power to them. It's not saying you have to do this stuff. But when it comes for the next promotion, and it comes for the next opportunity, who is management gonna hire? The one who loves to do the job. So by doing something you're passionate at, not only do you get to do something you're passionate at, you are going to be better at it. And this one really, really matters. Lots of you probably are going through the process right now of thinking about where you wanna go for university, what you want to be studying. I'm just gonna give you one piece of advice. Choose something you love, choose something you like. Don't just do something because someone's like, you can make a lot of money doing that. Guess what, folks? If you were good at something, you can make a lot of money doing a lot of different things. I remember I had people, you know, I went and I did, um, how many, okay, how many mathematicians do we have in the room or people with a math degree? Okay, we got, we got some there, we got some over there. When I finished high school, I just liked math, okay? I liked numbers. It was my thing or whatever. That's what I did. I kind of am jealous of all of you now because anyone who is doing a math degree now, if you want, you could go work anywhere, you know? Like, you could go work, like, you know who like one of the biggest hires of mathematicians is right now? Professional sports teams. They are hiring the best people to be their, stat their stats guys. But stretch, reach. Ugh, I got my slide wrong. That is not a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. The next quote is from John Abley. There are two ways to compete in this world. You can drag your opponent down or you can rise above them. Which is better for a society in the long run? John Abley's the former uh, chairperson, chair of the board for FIRST, and I heard this quote in 2007, and it blew my mind when I heard it. Um, when you think of it, our world faces some big problems. Uh, my generation, the generation before mine, the generation before that one, kind of messed this planet up. Really sorry about that, folks. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's bad. To solve these big problems, we need people and companies to come up with solutions. But if the companies are all sniping with each other to try and get these solutions or trying to steal each other's IP and trying to drag each other down, we are not gonna solve the problems as quickly as we could if people are working together. The way we fix this world is instead of dragging your opponent down, you try and rise above them. But this one really applies. Most of you are all in high school, some are you in university. Um, how many of you are like the smartest kid in your school? You could say it. Or like one of the smartest kids at your school. Okay, you know. How do people usually treat the smartest kid in the school? It's often like, oh, yeah, they, they might have the highest grades, but they're only book smart. They're not actually smart. Or, oh yeah, she might have the best grades. She'll never get a boyfriend. Oh, he probably doesn't go out. He studies all the time. What are we doing? Why would we talk about people that way? 
the proper way to look at it is like, wow, they are so smart. What can I learn from them? Maybe they want to study with me. Maybe I can pick something up along the way. You're never going to grow as a person unless you're trying to rise above. If you're always making excuses and your excuses involve looking down at other people, you're circling the drain, folks. And that's not the way we should be doing things. We need to be celebrating excellence. Hey, folks, we see this in our community. How do some people talk about the best teams in the world? Oh, yeah, their mentors built the robot. Is that true? Probably not. How about, but what does it serve you if it was true to say that? Why not just go to their pit and be like, hey, how'd you design that? Guess what? They would probably tell you. They might just give you their CAD, you know? There's, if you were spending all your time being negative about others, you're not going to learn from them. And it's just, it's not going to be helpful. Uh, the final quote, limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. Michael Jordan said this in his Hall of Fame speech. Uh, what does it mean? So the limits that we are exposed to in our lives are not created by us. From a young age, everyone in a box and say, you are this kind of person. You are a jock. You are a brain. You are going to be an engineer. Those limits are an illusion. That's just people talking. You control who you get to be. You control your destiny. So when you feel that you're coming up against a limit, think about who created that limit. Did I? Did someone else? And is it real? Now, folks, there are some limits that are real, and we are going to talk about that in the presentation. The job for all of you is on your teams to figure out which limits are real or which limits are imposed. All right, folks, strategic design. This is the good stuff here. Designing and building a cool robot is a lot of fun. But designing a robot that does well in competition is even more fun. So what is strategic design? Strategic design is a concept where you are figuring out what you are going to design. A lot of teams will start, they see the new game, the first thing they want to do is like, oh yeah, yeah, I know what the robot's going to do. It's going to do this and let's start caddying. Absolute wrong approach. First, games are complicated, especially this one, and you need to actually have a plan of what you're trying to do. Wayne Grutzky always used to say, I don't skate to the puck, I skate to where the puck is going to be. You have to figure out your goals and what your robot wants to do first, and that is strategic design. To go about your strategic design, you have to have a goal, a concrete aim. In my mind, the clear choice is you want your robot to win. How that does that, we'll get to. A lot of other secondary objectives exist. Some teams just want to have the best looking robot. Some teams really pride themselves on design elegance. Some teams pride themselves on wanting to do the coolest weird thing. 4907 in the house, anyone remember the jumping robot from a couple years ago? That was cool. That was absolutely cool. Were there better hanging devices? Sure. But their goal was they wanted to do something cool. And they did. And guess what? Everyone will remember them forever. Possibly because I won't stop talking about them, but, you know. Um, in FRC, though, be careful with the cool factor. Because if you spend so much time working on a robot that's cool and it doesn't actually work, that could be fun, but you have two alliance partners for every match. And now you are, there is that. We do have an obligation to try and support all our alliances all the time. So to do strategic analysis, to do strategic design, you have to analyze the game. And when you do that, you have to read the rules. And the first thing you do when you read the rules is figure out every possible way how to score points, no matter how obscure. So this year, there were some obscure ways of scoring points. I'm going to talk a lot about passing, OK? How many teams have run a passing, in this room have run a passing strategy so far this, this season? Good. Some of you have. If you haven't, pay attention, folks. This is a key part of the game that a lot of people just missed. Because we've been in a paradigm of your robot just puts a thing in the thing and scores points. Do the thing. Just, but there's different ways to score points. And one of the ways is not actually directly scoring the points, but setting your partners up to score the points. And it's intensely valuable this year. The teams who are the best passers are the ones who did this game analysis and realized passing was going to be a thing put that into their strategic design, which then went into their robot design. So they're designed around passing.
Do you think it's an accident that 2056's passes hit their opponent's bumper right on the back, right on their intake every time? They designed around that. 254 designed around this because they, they did the analysis. How many of you see the fan bots this year? Okay, so here's how this works, folks. The trap, the trap is like above the chain. You can't get to it without being on the chain, right? Well, you can't touch it without being on the chain, but what if you could open the trap another way? So this is what I say, like, yeah, like, you know, like if you had the Scarlet Witch, she would use her telekinesis and just open it. But there are no MCU characters in first, so how else could you do it? Well, one team, and I, Libby, who was the team that did the fan first? 4028, bird beak, beak bird? Beak squad, yeah, you know, it's a beak, whatever, quack. Um, they were like, okay, let's just take a 775 motor, put it in a fan, and blow the trap. And they realized it opens the trap up. And suddenly you can shoot into the trap like it's the amp. And that means you don't have to be on the chain. It is wild. But you can't do something like that unless you've done this analysis. And this is why you have to read the rules and think about things and understand that contact isn't always required. This talks about the jumpy robot. You know, they wanted to hang and they said the fastest way to hang is to jump. Did you know you don't actually have to touch the chain to be hanging this year? Who, who knew that? A couple people knew that. So if you could somehow have your robot jump three seconds after the match ends and stay in the air, you would get a hang every time? Is that impossible? Probably. But if you, if you don't think about these things, you could miss out. And we'll talk about lots of things that people have missed or whatever. But the rules apply to different things. And also, it's different for your generation. Because you have discords, you have Chief Delphi. Well, Chief Delphi has been there forever. It's actually a terrible website. But that, that aside, it exists. And there's lots of information being shared. Read. See what other people are talking about. See what their bad ideas are. Because there's no such thing as a bad idea. It's just an idea that hasn't been fully explored. So try out the different things that are, exist. Um, it is very important because this analysis is all about trying to win. What does it mean to win? It is not just about winning matches, especially in the modern version of first. Ranking points matter. And if you want to design your robot to do really well, one way to do it is to say, I want to control as many ranking points as possible. And so you need to understand how th this works. First shifted to the ranking point era in 2016, and it's the best thing that has happened to first, at least in terms of the competition side. Because it gives you more ways to show off what you're doing and earn value for it. So some, you could have the worst qualification schedule ever, but you can still get two ranking points a match because that's your alliance that's doing that. Only if you've optimized around these sorts of things. And so that's an important one to look at. Um, chokehold strategies. This is my, my favorite part of this presentation. Okay, I should probably delete this slide because there hasn't been a good chokehold strategy since about 2010. And the first game design committee is very, very good, composed of very intelligent people who spend their time making sure there is no chokehold strategy. What is a chokehold strategy? A strategy which, when executed, guarantees victory independent of any action by your opponents. This means if you do your thing, you're winning no matter what. And now, the young... How many people in this room were alive in 2002? Oh, that is so sad. That is so sad. We are so old. Okay, I'm gonna cry for a little bit. Um, there was a very cool chokehold strategy in 2002. I wanna talk about it. Team 71. Okay, this is gonna break my heart as well. How many of you have heard of Team 71? Good. They were the best team in first for a decade. They won four championships from 1997 to 2004. It was wild. So back then, there's the way you saw robots you wanted to see is you lined up outside their pit when they would uncrate their robot. Because robots were shipped from event to event in a crate. There would be like 100 people lined up outside of 71's robot to see it come out. And then usually what would happen is they'd open it and like a bunch of random stuff would fall out because it was never done. Because they were just constantly working. But they did the coolest things. So this game in 2002 was wild. The field was about the same size it is now. It was only 48 feet wide. And there were three 180 pound goals at the center of the field. 
and there were five zones. And if you could take the goals to your zone, each goal in a zone was worth 10 points. So you can get 30 points like that. Simple math right there. If there were balls on the field, and you got points if balls were in the goal, but the goal was in your zone. And these goals were neutral. They weren't red or blue. So the only way you can get points for balls is if the goals are in your zone. So if there's three goals, and I take all three of them, I've got 30 points, and my opponents can't get any goal points, and they can't get any ball points. But how else could you score points in this game? Well, you got 10 points for, it was two on two back then, folks, two on two. You got 10 points for every robot that was in your end zone, which was on the opposite side of the field. So you're like, oh, I can get 20 points. But first was also very different back then. First of all, there were no bumpers, and you could do like weird things. So like, you were allowed to kidnap robots then. Yeah, you could grab your opponent and drag them to your side of the field. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm gonna beat my robot, I'm gonna take my robot and I'm gonna take the three goals somehow and get to zero points. My opponent can get two robots back and then they can just go kidnap my partner. I know it sounds weird, it sounds weird, but just stick with me, it was a thing. It was graciously professional, it was fine. They could grab my, and then it'd be 30-30, so it was a tie. What was the tiebreaker that year? The number of goals. So if you had all three goals, you were gonna win every single match, except the goals were 180 pounds, folks. They were heavy. And there was three of them, and they were spread apart. So there would be one in the center, and it's like 12 feet, 12 feet. Very, very far away. Doesn't seem logical to get them. But Team 71 did this analysis, and they're like, if we can get all three, we're going to win every match. So let's just do it. How do they do it? The robot started upright, which was legal back then. By the way, there are so many rules that exist today that came into play because this team just blew through everything. So the robot started standing up, would flop over so they could have a larger area, then expand these giant arms out. And so it would then zoom super, super fast in a high gear to get to the goals first and then would lock on to all three of them with claws that could not let go. By cho like, it manually after the match would have to take an Allen key to pop them open. So they grab onto something, they got it, because they didn't want to let go of these goals. So they do that, and it's like, but then they still got to move 540 pounds of stuff. So what they did was they lifted the goal slightly to transfer some traction onto themselves, but they wanted to have as much grip as possible. Anyone familiar with a, what a file card is? It's a, dev a metal device used to clean files. Those were legal back then. So instead of wheels, they walked on file cards which dug into the carpet, which meant no one could push them. But they wanted to make sure that they had as much power to do this, so they would do 540 pounds. They downshifted to a low gear that was moving at about an inch or an inch and a half per second. That was the speed. You know, you talk about 20 feet per second robot. It just inch and slowly inch forward, moving, moving, moving with those goals. But they would get to the goal so quickly, they've won. So, okay, it's now division finals or something like this. They were playing three of the best teams in the world back then. Team 65, 67, and 68. I think 68 and 67 were on the field. So the hot team, truck town, these were, robots were just wild. They're like, okay, we just gotta beat 71 to one of the goals. If we beat them to one of the goals, they've only got two, we control that goal, we can fill it with balls. So 71 flops over, grabs one goal, they grab a center goal, they go to grab the third goal, but 68 beat them to it, or 67 beat them to it. So they can't, but 67 lingered into the area for a little bit, and 71's arm went out, and it accidentally grabbed onto 67. <laughs> they can't let go, folks. And kidnapping is legal. So they just, their arms just lurched back, and they dragged 67, flung them across the field. Now they have three goals, and 67, because 67 is attached to a goal, and they have all this match. And so 68 is like, well, let's go try and pull the goal away from them. So they latched onto one of the goals, and they're like, coming for the ride. So they're now dragging 540 pounds of goals, 240 pounds of robots, and just going inch by inch by inch. Any of, you, for, any of you game announcers for FRC in this room? Or am I the only one here? We got one right there. So you're like, no, the number one rule of game announcing is like to never say the match is over. You have to make every team feel like they have a chance. 
the announcer, he was this uh, thick, he had this thick, thick Boston accent. He was a great guy. And he's just like, well, you know what they say, it ain't over till it's over, but there ain't much hope. <laughs> and for the last minute of a match, he had nothing to talk about because they're just going. He's like, he just started reading off sponsors. He's like, the first championship sponsored by. <laughs> like, congratulations to these teams. Shout out to all the moms in the stands for doing your thing. It's like, it was over. It was wild. And he just dominated. They won a championship that way. That was a chokehold. What did I talk about earlier about chasing perfection? Probably not going to get to perfection. You are probably not going to find a chokehold in first games because there's a lot of smart people who try and eliminate them. But if you are looking for chokeholds, you will find good strategies along the way. And this should be your first step in any strategic design process. How can we dominate this game? I spend so much time on that slide for something that's never going to happen, but it's just a cool story. It's just a cool story. There ain't much hope. All right, folks, cost-benefit analysis. You're coming up with strategic design. You want to figure out what you want to do to help win matches. But it's just, you can't just pick, oh, this gets me the most points. I should do it. You have to con compare the reward to the level of difficulty. So in 2023, high grid versus low grid. In the audience, I see some of my friends from Team 9098, probably the best low bot in the world last year. Sorry you couldn't be at championship, but welcome to the championship this year. Congratulations, congratulations. You only got a couple extra points for scoring up high last year. But scoring low was so much easier. Because you, you had to reach out and up, and all these teams are falling on the grid or whatever. Low bots could be really, really simple and really, really effective. And it was way less effort for a lot of reward, and that's the kind of analysis you should do. Because we'll get to this, not every team can do everything. And sometimes it's actually better to do the lower value tasks instead of the higher value tasks. And so that's just a really important thing to think about. The trap, is it a trap? This is an open question because I don't actually know the answer yet. Is the trap a trap, folks? Okay, good, I got a, I got a mixture of answers right there, that's perfect. That means first is designed a good game because there isn't an optimal strategy for this sort of thing. The trap is hard. Can everyone agree with that, that the trap is hard? Yeah. Even for those of you with fans on your robot, you know, the trap is hard. Is it valuable? Oh, heck yeah. You can lock up a ranking point. Like, it is the e best way to lock up a ranking point aside from having 2056's human player, who is just uh, another species uh, out there or whatever. A lot of effort, but a lot of reward. Just because it's a lot of reward doesn't mean that everyone should do it. Because your robot might be better by not doing the trap. Some of the best teams in the world, 3005, 2056, do not have a trap mechanism this year. You do not need to do everything. The best teams in the world don't usually do everything. But teams that do everything and don't do them well, traditionally are some of the worst teams in the world. Keep that in mind. So the best tacks to perform are the ones which are relatively easy, yet provide big points. Um, defense. Oh, defense. Denying your opponents 10 points is just as good as scoring 10 points. Um, we will talk about net bots later on in this presentation, but there is so much value in just being able to slow down your opponent. And especially if you, can, if you are a net bot who also has a really good intake with like a low shot, so maybe you can play D, play D, oh, snipe a note, pass it out. Play D, play D, snipe a note, pass it out. Defense, the days of defense of just like, oh, I'm going to go push someone and slam into them or just, actually, I don't, there's a very valid pinning strategy in this game. Maybe we'll get to it. Maybe we won't. But um, strategic tactical defense has a lot of value. But to be really good at it, it needs to be part of your strategic design, not an afterthought. Although some of you should be thinking of this afterthought after Thursday's qualification matches. I mean that in the kindest way, but it's just like only so many robots are going to make the playoffs. There's a good chance that up to eight defense robots are going to make the playoffs in each division. If you want to be one of them, you should probably show people. Um, you need to make a priority list. This is where you've gone through the strategic design and you're trying to figure out what you want to prioritize on. I like to have two different types of priority lists. 
One is robot qualities where you're talking about, I want my robot to be fast. I want to have a low center of gravity, et cetera, et cetera. What are your priorities in terms of qualities? And then what are your priorities in terms of functionality? You know, shoot balls, climb bridges, traverse the field. At some point, you can merge these two lists and then decide on a drive system. Swerve. Should you do it? Let me pull up a stat here, folks, because uh, someone just said yes. You have not been paying attention. There's more thoughts to this, folks. Come on. Let me just look at the email. Pardon? That is true. They exist. OK, all right. Let's go. All in. OK. So I have been trying to capture stats on all the Swerve bots around the world this year. There are approximately, this is wild to me, 72% of the robots in the world this year were Swerve. You want to hear another wild stat? 528 of the robots this year were kit bots. So about one in seven. So like 14%. So that leaves us, that hits us to about 86%. So there's about 14% that are other. It is, there is a, just a, if you are not doing Swerve and you're not doing a kit bot, you're probably at the point where you're, you're making a mistake. You probably want to go in one of these lanes. The very simple kit bot that's just going to get things done, or maybe go to Swerve. Swerve is expensive, folks. There's no getting around that. It is not necessarily the right decision for everyone. However, I wouldn't be realistic if I wasn't going to just tell you what it is. There are some folks this weekend who are going to be Alliance captains who will not pick a tank bot. They've already said they have their list. There are no tank bots are going on the list. That's frustrating, because there are some really, really good swerve bots. I mean, tank bots. There's obviously good swerve bots. I can't make this decision for you, but I can help you make the decision by talking about what you're going to have to do to make that decision. We'll get in that in the next couple slides. All right, folks, priority list. This is the priority list for a crescendo. What should be number one on your priority list? It is so good because 10 years ago, everyone would get this wrong. They'd be like, score. How are you going to score if you don't drive, numbskull? <laughs> also, if you can just drive and nothing else on your robot works, you can still play defense. You can slap a hockey net on your robot. You're good to go. What should be your number two? Oh, someone got it wrong. Someone got it wrong, but a lot of people got it right. It's not necessarily intake, folks. It is acquire game pieces. That can be done by intaking, or it can be done by going to the human player station, which the kit bot does effectively. Your priority list should always be move, acquire slash release, score. Exceptions to this rule are if you are prioritizing on a ranking point and you want to focus on end game. But this is the way it should be. You have to be able to drive, and you have to be able to drive consistently. Let's go back to Swerve for a second. I saw a lot of teams this year who had Swerve bots, and then at their competition, they're like, they, they, you hear Pit Admin, if there's anyone who knows how to program a Swerve bot, please go to team XXXX's Pit. Folks, probably should have chosen a different drivetrain. You need to robot to move, and it's not just about the design. Everything has to work for it to move. So be thinking about these sorts of things. Acquisition and release of game pieces is so important. Notice that I have score separate from acquisition and release because sometimes just acquisition and release is enough to score. A Lobot last year didn't need to have an arm necessarily to score. It's that sort of thing. This year you could be a wicked shuttler of notes just with an intake. So things to think about. Also, if you're not relying on mechanism number two or number three, there's less things that can break. Okay, folks, uh, this is probably the most important slide in the presentation as I look at the time. Oh my goodness, we got so much time. So much time for activities. If you're only gonna remember two things from this presentation, I would like you to remember the two things from this slide. Actually, maybe remember the quotes at the beginning. Possibly remember how to pronounce my last name. Golden rule number one, always be build within your team's limits. I talked about limits earlier. Sometimes they're not real. But to figure out what limits exist for your team, you have to evaluate your abilities and resources honestly and realistically. 
What are these limits? It can be people power, i.e. the number of people on your team, your team's budget. Money is a real constraint in first. It is, you know, we can't hide from that. Experience, is your team a bunch of grade nines or is it grade 12s who've been doing this for a long time? And time, this is a big one right now. Gone are the days where all the top first teams were working 60 hours a week. Thank goodness those days are gone. Those were horrible. That was not healthy for anyone. There are some teams that only build 10 hours a week. If you're only going to build 10 hours a week or be in the shop 30 hours a week, that is a massive difference and your limits, that it defines one of your limits and how you should design your robot. Um, in general, you need to avoid building unnecessarily complex things. The simplest thing that works is the best way to go. Uh, I mean, the best robots, you look at them, it, they are actually at their core pretty simple. And if you do a bunch of things that are simple, then you can squeeze in some neat, complex stuff along the way. Um, as you get more experienced, you need to start cautiously pushing some boundaries, though. If you still believe the limits that your team had from your rookie season and you're in your fifth year, you might be short-selling yourself. And this applies in life, too, folks. If we always stay within our boundaries, we never grow. So you do have to push limits. There's like this neat thing. Um, they did a study with a bunch of um, business people, and they said, hey, okay, we're going to give you a ring. Oh, yes, yeah, rings this game. It's perfect. And there's like a bottle. You've got to toss the ring on the bottle. And um, you can do it from wherever. You can do it up close. You can do it from as far away. Uh, the folks who turned out to be the best entrepreneurs, what distance did they do it from? No, they did it from the middle. So the ones who were doing it from the far were just the people who were like, yeah, let me just try. Hopefully I can get it. Hopefully I can get it. Yeah, I'm going to get it next time. Yeah, I got this. I got this. Not the way to go. The ones who went up close were looking for something easy. The ones who went to the middle kind of went, I want a challenge, but a challenge that is reasonable. And that's kind of what you're looking for with robots. It's got to be something that's achievable. But if you're, if you're not challenging yourself, what's the point? Okay, golden rule number two, probably the most important one. If a team has 30 units of robot functions, and functions have a maximum of 10 units, so you go to the robot store, and I want to buy some robot functionality, you know, I want to buy an intake, I want to buy a gripper, or whatever, I've only got $30, and each, the best ones cost $10. It is always better to have three functions that are a 10 out of a 10, instead of a five out of, at six out of 10. The jack of all trades is the master of none. If you try and do everything and your limits don't allow for that, you are not gonna be as good as a team that specializes and picks just a couple things. Team 5409, are you in the building? 5409, anyone familiar with Team 5409? This robot is wicked good at the amp, got a good intake just really fast at the amp, and can trap three times a match. They go up and trap, go up and trap, go up and trap. They do not fire a single shot into the speaker. Division finalist as an alliance captain at the Ontario Provincial Championship, arguably the toughest event in the world. Wild, wild. They do not fire a single shot into the speaker. They said, we're just gonna focus on a couple things. We're gonna be the best trapping robot in the world and best amping robot in the world. They definitely are the best trapping robot in the world and they are a very, very good amping robot. And by being a 10 out of 10 and like a nine out of 10 was way better than if they had a six out of 10 shooter. Could have been anyone in this room, folks, but they had the courage to do it. You gotta be bold. So those are the golden rules. Folks, the teams that follow these golden rules are the most successful. The teams that don't are the teams that tend to fail. Also, with a simpler robot with less functions, here are the things that can happen. Number one, it can be finished earlier. Number two, there are less things to break. If your robot is finished earlier and has less things to break, you have more time for practice, you have more time for programming, and you have more time to iterate your robot. If you have a simple robot, you can go to your first competition, see what other teams are doing, and then adapt some of that and weave it in. There are some, I won't name names here, folks. There are some very good teams. You'd be shocked. Very, very, very good teams who um, in t last year didn't design an intake. They were, first event was in, I don't want to spot them, later in the season. 
They just waited to see what the best teams in the world were doing. They built a simple robot and had a spot for an intake and just waited. But you could only do that if your robot is simple and adaptable and you're not messing around with other things. Because if you were building a brand new intake in week three or week four, you better not be tweaking four other subsystems because it's not going to work. All right, folks, trade-offs. Engineering is about trade-offs. The key to deciding upon a design is to evaluate the trade-offs. Speed versus power, complexity versus durability. Last year, high CUG with more scoring versus low CUG with less scoring. Wide versus long, score versus... There is no... Can you... Out? Okay. Ryan, could you check that out for me? So, so, I don't know. Anyways, thank you, folks. Um, there is not a necessarily a right answer to these questions. The right answer has to fit within your strategic design. However, the choices that you make based on your analysis will determine the fate of your season. Your trade-offs have to be consistent. And this is the thing that drives me up the wall. A team will make a great strategic design priority list in week one, and then they won't look at it again. And then it'll be at their first event, and they are 10 pounds overweight, and they're making a decision on what to cut. The decision should be based on your strategic design priority list. And subsystem number five should be what goes instead of subsystem number three. But teams often are just like, this is the easiest thing to get rid of, so let's do that. Trade-offs have to be consistent. And always remember the golden rules, folks. Teams who try to do more than they're capable of tend to fail. There is no shame in building a simple robot. It's wild to me that we have these weird concepts in first, that there's like something wrong with building simple, like that there's something wrong with building a tank drive, or there's something wrong by not doing the high task, or something wrong with not scoring the speaker. Folks, there is nothing wrong with that. Simple robots can win. They're really, really fun. Also, what's fun is not having to stress in the pit because you're always having to fix something after every match. Like, simple is good. It is great. It is like... Oh, it's just nice. Build simple robots, folks. People never listen to me. I've been saying this for 20 years. Yeah, this slide's not... Uh, okay, I'll talk about this slide, sure. Um, it's nice when you can do two things with one function. You know, um, this year there's a lot of teams who use their intake. Their intake is their shooter sort of deal. That is great, as opposed to having to do a handoff and pass it through or whatever. So think about ways that you can multi... Get multi-purpose functionality out of there. Um, it's one less function to build. The risk is if it breaks, that's two functions you're losing with one subsystem breaking. Um, other strategic design tips. This, folks, is not optional. If you want to have a successful season, you need to do this. There is a tendency to skip this stage and jump right into design implementation, but it is dangerous if you do that. Um, you need to know, you know, I talked about this. Uh, be realistic when evaluating strategies. folks overestimate what robots are capable of. Even this year, everyone's like, oh, robots have gotten so much better. It's going to be way more cycles a match, 15 cycles a match, whatever. You've got to be realistic, folks. I have some rules of thumb. I call them rules of thumb because like, everyone's thumb is a different size, but it's like close enough, folks. This is not a science here. This is just something to help you plan things out. In general, Elite teams can do 10 full field cycles per match in perfect conditions. That means no defense. The best teams will only do it a handful of times in regular season matches. These numbers have gone up over the last couple of years because of swerve, because our motors are twice as powerful as they used to be, because there's no BOM anymore. By the way, folks, whenever, remember when everyone was like, oh yeah, get rid of the BOM, it's going to be the best thing ever. Now our robots are like twice as expensive as before. It is not the best thing ever. The BOM was a pain, but um, suddenly, you know what motors used to cost before the pandemic? The sim motor was, the best motor on the market, the sim motor was $25. Yeah, you're all like, what? What's he talking about? Sim motor, the workhorse, $25. Oh, it needed a motor controller card. It's like, yeah, you know what that motor controller costed? 50 bucks. $75, and you're going to be like, oh, inflation. Don't be that person that blames everything on inflation, man. Who are you, Lobla? Like, come on. Canadian joke for someone to get right there. I'm not going on a tangent like this. I'll go off. It is wild that we have $200 motors now, and everyone just accepts it, and everyone has to buy them. It is wild. It is just, 
Is first cooler because we have $200 motors? Did some people say yes? Maybe it is. I don't think so. First was pretty cool in 2019. 2019 was great. Richie, you were on Einstein Finals, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you won, right? One point? Oh. <laughs> Refs. Inspire that man to become a head referee. It's great. Um, middle tier teams usually can do five cycles per match, full field cycles in perfect conditions. I'm going to show you some charts. So the cycling rule of thumb. I call it the 8-4-2-1 rule. I now call it the 10-5-2-1 rule because it's gone a little bit tougher. A 99th percentile team, so like the best team at your event, is usually around 10 cycles per match in perfect conditions. Probably will average eight. A good team, which I define as the 86th percentile. Why do I choose the 86th percentile, folks? One standard deviation above the mean of assuming a normal distribution. It's on the slide. OK. Did you know it, or you just read the slide? OK, good, good, good. Um, that's what I define as a good team, one standard deviation above the mean of, uh, across normal distribution. Usually averages four or five cycles per match. Average team, two to three. Below average team, one cycle per match. You think I'm kidding? I brought data from before some of you were born. Look at these numbers. It's just kind of, there's some fluctuation because some games aren't true full cycle games. 2019 was not a full cycle game. It was more half cycles. 2022 was not a full cycle game because the game pieces were everywhere. Uh, 2024, some people thought it was a full cycle game. And then Patrick Mahomes showed up and everything changed. So um, you can see these numbers early on the season. You can kind of see the 8-4-2-1, 10-5-2-1 play out. Uh, later in the season, numbers go up a little bit. Teams get better as the season goes on. Why do teams get better as the season go on? Practice, practice and iteration. They have more time. Uh, it is very cool right now. When I started doing first, uh, like only 20% of the teams went to more than one event. Now it's more like 70% of the teams go to at least two events. That is very cool because the best thing about first is the chance to improve on your designs and go through that iterative process. Championship. Last year, despite how great all those robots were, the top teams were still only topping out at around 9.8, 10 cycles per match. People thought it was higher. Now, part of that, you might be like, oh, well, you could only score 27. No, you could score more than 27 last year because they did supercharged nodes at the championship. These rules still apply. What's it going to be this weekend? I'm going to talk about how these stats won't mean anything this weekend when we get into the scouting stuff. I have a lot to say about statistics this season, folks. It's going to get spicy. Hey, scouting folks, who here is a scout on their team? Yeah, my people, my people. <laughs> this past weekend, I watched 600 matches. Because I was just like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> I'm getting ready for champs. I have to talk about robots all weekend long. I got to watch matches, you know, just like what? And it is fun. Scouting is an area that is neglected by many teams, but is crucial for two main reasons. It helps you predict your opponent's strategy for future matches, and it is absolutely essential for picking alliances. All right, folks, let me uh, pull out my notes here, because we're going to do a case study. This is the case study. So everyone who has seen this presentation before, or has an MBA, or works for NASA, just zip it for a little bit, folks. Please, and like, don't be that person, because there was always the kid in class who would like read one chapter ahead, and the teacher asked, what's the answer to this? They'd be like, oh, I know, and then the teacher would be like, oh, you're so smart. No, they're just being annoying, okay? So like, <laughs> let's do this. All right, folks. We're sponsored by Gene Haas Foundations. We're going to talk about racing. There's a, there's a race car company. This is all fictional, okay? Carter Racing. John Carter is the lead of Carter Racing, and he has one hour to make a decision. The most important auto race of the season is Lumi. It's going to be broadcast on live TV, and if their team wins, they could win a lot of money and get future sponsorship, which would secure their team for years to come. It would change their lives if they do well in this race. There's a problem, though. In the past 24 races the Carter Racing's been in, seven times they've blown out their, their engine. Happens. An engine failure on live TV would jeopardize any potential sponsorships. That is scary. It's not necessarily super dangerous. There are some safety risks, but no one's going to die. So don't start weighing that into this factor here. 
But, so like they have a choice to make. Do they race or do they not, knowing that this, this risk exists? But withdrawing has consequences too. If they just back out of this race, they're gonna lose the registration fee, sponsors are gonna be unhappy, they have to make a decision here. So the team has a hunch about the failures. They think it might be related to colder weather. And their analytics group, without much time, kind of like the scouting groups before line selection, has put together a graph to test this hunch. So this is the temperature in Fahrenheit, which is a weird scale, don't really love it, you know, it's a little bit weird, um, that shows when the failures happen. And you see, this is the data that's being presented. Today's race is going to be in 40 degree weather. The question is to whether to race or withdraw. Before I ask for the answer, I want to know, do any of you have any questions about other data you would like to see from the scouting team? So you're the strategy team now on your team. What would you like to see? Pardon? So that is a very good question. That is a question that was not asked. Other questions? I, I'm coming back to you. Right there? Correct. You're a smart one. That's two very good points right there. I see blonde directly in front of me. Folks, I'm very proud of the people in this room. You just saved the lives of seven astronauts. What? Hold on, folks. Here is the data with the races where there weren't failures. Now I ask you the same question. Are you racing or are you withdrawing? The choice is to withdraw. So often we get incomplete data or we only look at a segment because it's easier. But you miss this. Folks, this is not a hypothetical case from business school. This data is from the Space Shuttle Challenger and the O-ring failures. Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986, seven astronauts, including Krista McAuliffe, who was immortalized on a coin by Dean Kamen, a school teacher, went up in the air before they had a decision to make whether to make that launch. And someone on a napkin sketched out the temperature graph of those failures and said, take a look at this. They're like, oh, this graph is fine. There's no correlation. But they didn't ask the right questions that you asked. And if they had raised ask those questions, that shuttle doesn't explode. That shuttle doesn't launch that day. Are people upset? Sure. You always need to ask the right questions. This is real, folks. I was six years old watching that in my kindergarten class when that shuttle went up, embedded in me for years. So when I saw this story, it was like wild. The power of data, but it's not just the power of data, it's the power of how data is presented. When you go to your pick list meetings, folks, you need to be making decisions on the actual data, not on the nice graph that someone drew. Persuade, and this goes for anything. You have to make decisions based on the actual material, not how nice their Canva presentation is. So think about this. So what needs to be learned here in regards to first? Having data isn't enough. You have to have the right data. And we're going to talk a lot about that coming up and you always have to ask questions about the data. It doesn't matter if you think your question is dumb. Your question might be the question that saves seven astronauts. Or this week, your question might be the question that prevents you from picking a team who's going to have a failure and send you to lower bracket. You have to ask the right questions. Also, do not rely on numbers without exploring the concept, context. Do you know what a given stat means? If I hear one more person be like, oh, this team's the best team in the world because they have the highest EPA, and then I'm like, can you explain EPA to me? Yeah, go to statbotics.com. I'm like, can you explain EPA to me? Yeah, it's statbotics, it's the highest number. You need to know what this stuff means, folks. And we'll teach you. So advanced scouting, what is advanced scouting? It is looking at past results and coming up with different correlations or whatever. How many of you are familiar with the stat OPR? It is a good stat. Do you know who developed that stat? Right here, right here, yes, yes, yes. Um, you know how I came up with that stat? I was trying to 
come up with ways to contextualize NBA players. Um, Allen Iverson was a very good basketball player, but he, he was overrated. And I was convinced that he was overrated. So I was trying to find a stat to show that he was overrated. And so in basketball, you have five players on the court at the same time. And if you just looked at who scored points, you would think Allen Iverson was the best player of his generation because he was the leading scorer. But there was a weird thing that Allen Iverson's teams sometimes did better when he was on the bench. And so it's like, well, why don't we look at every moment that a player was on the court and look at the baskets that were scored and regard the presence of each one there and then pull that sort of stuff out. That's what OPR does. In a match, we can't just look at total score because there's three teams on the alliance and different ones are contributing different amounts. And so what OPR does is we form a, a giant matrix for, and every row of the matrix represents a match. So we have ones for the teams that were in the match and their score. And OPR, you t invert that giant matrix. How many of you are familiar with linear algebra here? Okay, it's a great course. Take it in first year. You will enjoy it. If you're an engineer or not an engineer, actually, you might not enjoy it. I'm a little bit weird. But if you know these applications, you might think it's cool. You invert that matrix and you come up with these sorts of numbers which show the calculated contribution, which is what I wanted the stat to be called, but then people started calling it OPR and it just stuck, whatever. Calculated contribution. The calculated contribution of that team to the match. But it's not necessarily the points the team scored. It's the points that the team enabled. At the same time as I was trying to figure this out from the NBA, some smarter people than me figured it out for the NBA, and they actually kind of showed that Allen Iverson wasn't actually as great as he was. You know who also fared really badly in, uh, they call it adjusted plus minus in the NBA. Kobe Bryant fared badly in that one. Players who just were very good at getting their own numbers, but not necessarily elevating their teammates. You know who fared the best in that stat of all time? This is an easy answer, folks. If you don't get this one, you're going to kill him. Michael Jordan, folks, the greatest basketball player of all time. Oh, my goodness. Braun does well, too, but not as well as Michael. Sorry. We don't have a lot of basketball fans here, I guess. Okay. All right, so how does it work? I just kind of explained how it works. But how valuable is the data in this game? Well, it depends. In 2024, OPR was actually a fantastic stat. Um... A really funny story. I was um, helping a team with their pick list in 2019, dear friend of mine, and I was trying to explain OPR to them. And they were just like, this stat sounds made up. I'm like, yeah, it's made up. Everything is made up. All words are made up. Thor told us this already, okay? It's like, this stat doesn't make any sense. And, sh and then they're like, oh, this stat is stupid. Look at this team. Because there was a team at the Western event that year that had a plunger on their robot. It was really, really cool. And they were really good at scoring panels. They scored like eight panels. Plunger team, 6378. She's like, the plunger team only scores panels, but they have like a positive cargo OPR. How could that be possible? The stat is stupid. It's like, now you're just being mean to me. But why wasn't the stat stupid? Why did this team that only scored panels have a positive cargo OPR? Right. This team never actually scored cargo, but they were so good at scoring panels, they enabled their partners to score more cargo. Their presence in a match enabled more cargo to be scored. However, if you were just scouting normally and just like, tracking the amount of, you would say, oh, they don't score any cargo. Why would I want them on the alliance? OPR can figure this stuff out. So why is OPR valuable this year? Because OPR can figure out passing. A robot's presence on an alliance, the alliance scores more points generally. They might not be scoring the notes, but it shows that someone was doing something here to get these points scored. And that is where passing comes on. OPR indicates notes enabled. So let me go into, there's a lot to say here, and I didn't really condense it into all these slides, but there's a lot here. All right, folks, who are the football fans in the room? Who's the best quarterback in the NFL right now? Thank you. I'm glad we didn't have any disagreement on that one. Is Patrick Mahomes the greatest quarterback of all time? Probably not. Yet. He's got a long career ahead of him. Dude is young. The reason I talk about Patrick Mahomes is because I want to talk about two of his teammates slash former teammates. Anyone familiar with Tyreek Hill? One of the best wide receivers in the NFL. Starred with Patrick Mahomes for years. Y'all familiar with Kadarius Tony? 
<laughs> People are laughing. People are laughing. That means you know. Tyreek Hill and Patrick Mahomes starred together for years, and everyone knew Patrick Mahomes was great. But people didn't necessarily know how good Tyreek Hill was. They weren't sure if Tyreek Hill was good because of Patrick Mahomes or if Tyreek Hill was good on his own. Some people thought that maybe Tyreek Hill was making Patrick Mahomes look good. Tyreek Hill then leaves, goes to Miami, does amazing without uh, Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes still continues to do good. But stats don't necessarily convey this. Kadarius Tony actually put up some really decent numbers with Miami, I mean, with, with Kansas City. Folks, Kadarius Tony is terrible. He is not good. He drops passes all over the place. He's a train wreck. But his conventional stats looked really good. Why did Kadarius Tony's stats look good? Because Patrick Mahomes was throwing him the ball. This amazing best quarterback ever was throwing him the ball. If you don't scout properly, and if you were only looking at your scouted data just in a vacuum, you may think you're picking Tyreek Hill, but you will accidentally pick Kadarius Toney. I am not exaggerating, folks. You will look, tomorrow, there is gonna be a team that is gonna score 14 notes in a match. You're gonna be like, oh my goodness, 14 notes, that is wild. But you're not gonna think of the context and not realize that one of the elite passers, the Patrick Mahomes of first, whoever that might be this season, just laid 14 passes on the rear bumper. That they just intake shot, intake shot, intake shot, and did very little work. But if you're really carefully looking at the stats, you may notice that certain teams make everyone else better around them. And that's where you have to do this. So what stats should you be looking at? Like in life, folks, the answer is not in the back of the textbook. There is not just one stat to look at. I think you need to look at a combination of stats. Let's just talk about OPR before we get to EPA. I think it is very important to have scouted data on number of notes scored, obviously. You should also have scouted data on number of passes made. You should probably have some sort of measurement on the accuracy of the passes. You should probably be trying to link to see how many of those passes actually got scored. But a lot of that can just be sussed out using OPR, specifically component OPR on teleoperated notes. That will suss out where some of the passing is. You need to look at both these statistics. OPR total is a good stat this year for predicting how well a team is going to do in a qualification match. I don't love it for pick lists. Can anyone tell me why? Every robot is different, but that's not the reason. Uh, a little bit, but OPR should suss that out. It's close. You're, you're very close. That, that, that's, a, that's a very good point, but not the one necessarily what I was going for. These are all good points. So your OPR is going to tell you how well a team scored points. What's the best way to score points this year? Someone just shout it out. Scoring an amplified speaker, exactly. However, when I'm, if I'm the Alliance captain, because there are some teams that are bad at scoring at amplified speakers and that they just score at the wrong time, whatever, but they're very good at scoring notes. If you were the Alliance captain, you get to control the strategy and you get to control the amping. So a team that may not be the best at scoring points because they were using poor amp strategies could become very valuable to your Alliance because they were very good at scoring notes. And so that's why total OPR isn't necessarily the whole story. So you have to look at these different stats. But here's the other thing. OPR usually you need somewhere from at least six, probably nine matches before the stat stabilizes. If you start looking at OPR after the second or third match, it's just like wild swings, just like all over the place. So it's not necessarily the best stat to look at until the end. What is the stat you want to be looking at? Our friend EPA. These are both good stats. OPR is a better indication of what a team has done in a given event. But EPA, folks, how many of you realize that EPA is not an event-specific stat, but is a season-long stat? How many of you realize that EPA includes past seasons? So, like, 
the kids who graduated last year, they're still influencing your EPA this year. Some people think that's terrible. Others are like, wait a second. I've noticed some consistency from teams to teams. You're like, hey, you know what? Someone asked me who the best teams in the world are going to be next year. 254, 13, 23, 20, 56. Okay, done. You know, like, you can figure that stuff out. The past does affect things. However, there's a lot of teams who change their robots throughout the season. But their EPA is being influenced either positively or negatively from early on in the season. EPA is a good, better predictor of future events as it factors in more than just a given event. It stabilizes very, very early. It is hard to move your EPA late in the season. But EPA does have a long memory. So you need to be thinking about that. I like to use EPA for the first half of events. So therefore, be more likely to use OPR for a pick list. But like, you have a lot of tools in your tool belt. You have to use them at the right time. And folks, there's not always going to be a presentation like this to tell you what to use. You've got to figure it out. And that's kind of cool, and it's kind of fun. But it's, uh, it is neat. There are so many stats out there. But folks, please don't pick stats just based on which, one, which website has the nicest GUI. That is not an appropriate way to pick stats or whatever, and I think that's what people have been doing this year. How are we doing on time here, folks? We have so much time. Okay, um, pit scouting. You should check out every team at the event and kind of know what their robot looks like. Take pictures, take actual good pictures. Don't just assign the most annoying kid to take the pictures. Take pictures that will be useful so when you're talking about the robots, you know what's going on there. Um, you should definitely know who the swerve bots are in your division, who the tank bots are, who the mechanum bots are. It would be really nice to know how much every robot weighs and what type of wheels they have because that gives you an idea of if you can push them, which is going to come up uh, really as a really important thing as we start talking about defense. Um, quality of construction. You can learn a lot from a ro oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this because a team I really care about has the worst bumpers this year. Um, you could learn a lot from a team's bumpers. I am serious. If a team takes their bumpers seriously, they probably take everything seriously. If a team doesn't take their bumpers seriously, it's like, ugh. Bumper quality is something I really, really look at. Not because I care if their bumpers are whatever, but you can tell a lot from that. Um, other random things I watch for, I really, really like to see how quickly a team moves to their joysticks after the end of autonomous mode. Anyone want to know why? Or have an idea why I look at that? And it's not because I care about who's getting a one second head start. I see, honestly, who cares the most. Teams who are going to jump to those controls are like, we want to do everything we can to win. And when you are picking an alliance, that's who you want on your side. And that's who you don't want to go against. There are some teams who it matters more to. And that is actually really hard to figure out, but you can notice it from such little things. The teams who gets their cart right to the field so they can unload right away, has those details sought out. The team who gets to the queuing line on time, these things matter. I'm, I'm looking at you, Rishi. I'm looking at you. But there's lots of things to watch when you're scouting. Um, love to watch human players to see, okay, when is the right time to start your amplification period? So is it, I mean, this, we're going to go multiple choice here, multiple choice. Is it right before you, so is it right away when you've gotten two notes in the amp? Is it right when your robot has come down the field and is loaded and ready to shoot? Is it right after you've shot? Okay, some people said yes there. You're wrong. So it's not right after you shot. Is it right after it's entered the goal? Some people said yes, you're also wrong. It is right after it's entered the goal and it's started to enter the serializer. Because the point will only be counted once it goes through the serializer, and if you wait till the very last second, you can get two extra seconds out of an amp period instead of two seconds that are going to be wasted. And that really, really matters as you try and get four in. You ever notice what the best human players are doing right before an amp period? They're not at the amp. They're looking at seeing it get into the serializer, and then they're running over to smack that button, or someone's staying at the button, and a drive coach is watch watching what's happening in that serializer. 
just a little tip for you all, folks. Um, this is going to get real, much more important when we talk about pinning. Um, match scouting is important. The having accurate data matters. With component OPR, the need for accurate data is a little bit less because I found this year that the plus or minus between component OPR and scouted data is um, about one note off, maximum two notes off. So you can get a lot out of that. Um, when you look at the ordinal ranks of component OPR and scouted data, correlation R squared 0.9, it's like very, very high. So you can get by, but like scouting data, like it gives you more than that. Because this year, like the passing stuff we're talking about, like OPR will give you a hunch that someone's a good passer, but is it going to tell you about the location and these sorts of things? Just the comments on how well driven something is. It is important to have scouts doing stuff. But you know what really sucks? is when scouts take bad data. And you know why scouts take bad data? Because they don't want to be there. So you have to give them a reason to be there. And there are two main ways to do that. Number one, the data has to be used. If scouts are taking data that no one's ever going to look at, or maybe like one person will look at once, they're going to check out, because they're just going to feel like it's an unimportant task. They'll be like dolphins. You know dolphins can tell the difference between busy work and not busy work? Yeah, it's wild. They're like scouts, essentially. But like the, the US Army was doing some sort of study or whatever, and they like kept giving dolphins tasks or whatever, and they were like, here, there's a reward. You get like a little fish. And the dolphins realized they were doing a, they sort of realized they were doing a, like a psychological test on them. They knew it wasn't, didn't matter. So the dolphins just stopped doing the task and just started messing up intentionally. Sound like any of your scouts? <laughs> you also need to recognize the good work that they're doing. Have an award for the best scout of the day. Don't just hype up your drive team. Hype up your scouts too. They are doing the work that is helping you win events and build pick lists. Um, also, and I can't believe I have to say this because there was a thread on Chief Delphi about this, but using fake money, gamble. Please do not gamble with real money. Don't, don't, don't do that sort of stuff. Rishi and I have a good friend who, yeah. But make it fun. So a fun thing to do is before a match, pick a random team in the match and just be like, okay, 90-98, uh, 10.5 notes this match, over or under. And then people have to make an educated guess. And they'll pay more attention to more matches because they want to be good at this sort of stuff. It's a fun game. It's a great way to do things. Some people just like scouting or are happy to watch 600 matches over the weekend. I don't know. Okay, folks, averages versus maximums. These are two different words with two different meanings. I'm stating this because some people in FRC don't know the difference. Because some people, if you say like, all right, how many notes do you score on ma a match on average? Oh yeah, 15. No, no, no. When they say that, they mean, we did 15 once on the practice field. Averages mean all your matches on a real field, including the match that you didn't move because your radio lost power, including the match where you were defended for a minute, 30 seconds. Averages are averages, but teams usually say average when they mean ma maximum over perfect conditions, and you have to learn the difference between the two. Beware of any strategist that uses those two terms interchangeably. This is why it's important to have your own data. Um, I don't like just knowing the average of a team. I like to know four stats. I would like to know their minimum of a stat, it's like minimum notes scored, their, their non-zero minimum, because Sometimes a zero will be, I don't know, radio disconnect or something like that. Average, and then max. I need to know the max because I want to know what the potential of this team is. Because when you are facing an alliance, if you just look at the three averages, no, 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 no. You have to assume everything's going to go wrong and your opponents are all going to play their best match ever at the same time. So you need to know what the maxes are. So, but then again, at this event, there's only going to be 10 matches per team. So if you're already looking at four data points, why not just look at everything? Um, basic math question. At this event, so I'm going to say 8.7 and 8.2 for this event. What is the difference between two teams who average 8.7 notes per match and 8.2 notes per match? It is five notes over 10 matches. That's barely anything. But some people will make these really rigidless decisions based on a difference in average of like 0.2 points or 0.3. Beware of just 
doing an ordinal rank where you use a stat and say, this is what we're ranking them on, and just rank them 1 through 24 or whatever. Like, beware about that. Put teams with similar scores in tiers. Because at this event, there's going to be like 8 million teams that, are, that can like do like in that 7 tier. So like you go from 6 to 8, you test. Hey, hey. Test, test. Is that any better? There we go. There we go. First updates now, saving the day again. Um, rank within tiers and use the other stats. Don't just rely on one stat within that tier, folks. So important at this event. There are so many good teams in that same tier. Also, like, the reason you scout is that pretty much anyone with a brain can figure out who the top five teams in a division are. But it is really, really hard to suss out six through 33. So... Um, Alliance selection, folks, this is a complex one. I want to revisit a lot of this stuff. Um, the entire process is dependent on scouting. Uh, I mean, for some people, it's dependent on vibes, which is weird. Um, talked to one drive coach, you know, recently. I was like, you watch any matches? Nah. Are you making your pick list? Yeah. How are you making it? It's like, I'm like, that is not how you make a pick list. Um, we often talk about the do not pick list. Should you have one or not? I think it's totally okay to have a do not pick list of teams that you can't work with or teams that don't meet your criteria, that just occupy the same space of the field, run the exact same autonomous modes as you and don't have other auto modes. Some people like to put teams on do not pick lists because it's like, that team stood in front of us in the stands and we couldn't see. That is like, if, if, if you want to, like first of all, hey folks, I mean this wholeheartedly. Your pick list is your pick list. You get to do whatever you want with that as a team. However, just try and be a little bit reasonable with the stuff here. Um, grudges, weirdness, doesn't work. Um, who should your alliance captain be? It should be someone who is level-headed and not going to get flustered on the field. For a high school student, Alliance selection is probably the most stressful experience possible. Even more stressful than driving the robot in a match. Because in the match, at least you get to zone out a little bit. Alliance selection, the whole world is watching you. You have 30 people up in the stands hoping that you are going to do what they want you to do. And it is rough. And sometimes you have an MC who won't stop jamming the microphone in your face. First of all, folks, if you need time during alliance selection, take your time. There is not a rule saying you have to pick in a certain amount of time. So take your time. They should give you that amount of time. Um, but put someone out. It, it's all good. Um, put someone out there that can handle that pressure because it's a lot. And it is, it is hard. It is stressful uh, for kids. Um, the second pick is crucial for the success of your alliance. At the championship, the third pick is crucial for the success of your alliance. We will talk more about that. But excellent teams usually get missed. Teams have gotten better at pick lists, but championship, because events are smaller these days, a lot of teams never go to an event that has more than 36 teams. And scouting a 75-team event can be overwhelming, and we see some weird picks happen. Um, a question I get a lot is, okay, we're the number one seed, and turns out a bunch of people are going to decline us. Should we break up alliances or not? It's known as the scorched earth strategy. I am going to be very clear here, folks. It is your pick list. You get to make the decisions. And no one should be trying to judge you based on the decisions you make. This is strategy. Everyone has different strategies. Um, some folks will say that it's not graciously professional to pick a team that you know is going to decline. That is a school of thought, and I respect that. However, if it was not graciously accept professional to decline, to, to pick someone who was going to decline, first wouldn't allow people to decline. You as the number one seed have earned the power to pick. You can pick however you want to choose. And if you don't want to pick someone who, because they're going to decline, that's totally fine too. But understand the strategy you have to execute. Um, this is where I get really blunt with everyone. 
Championship is a very complex event. Some people are playing 3D chess. Some people are playing 7D chess. There are, some of you will be number one seeds this weekend, and it will be a surprise. And sometimes you have a lot of people telling you what to do who aren't on your team. Some of them will be there because they actually just care. Some of them have their own reasons to be there. Be wary of anyone who is not in your division who is trying to give you advice on how to pick. I have seen teams try and influence teams at the championship because they want to see certain alliances broke up because they think it will help their alliance in their division's odds. I've seen a lot of weird things. You should be picking, listening to advice of your own team, but also folks that are saying, this is the best way for you to win, as opposed to some weird esoteric strategies. Championship gets really, really weird, and people do strange things. Same thing's gonna happen with co-op this weekend, folks. If people who aren't involved in the match you're in are trying to tell you what to do about co-op, that is a red flag. Co-op if you want to co-op, folks. Um, but I do have one request of all of you. If you say you're going to co-op, co-op. That is a big one, folks. Because there's a lot of things that you know, are acceptable in competition, but one thing that will never be acceptable in terms of the social contract of gracious professionalism is lying. So if you're going to say you're going to co-op, now, if something happens and all three amp mechanisms break or whatever, but um, I don't I'm not in any of the discords, but people send me screenshots. I've seen a lot of people saying like, hey, last second, switch who's at the amp and then make sure that someone doesn't co-op with Team X. That's wild to me, folks. Like, what are we doing? This is a high school robotics competition here. We all want to win, but let's play this game with some honor and some integrity, and that's going to carry you further in life than oh, we ended up seeding number three instead of number five in your division or whatever. And you'll be able to respect that victory a lot longer. And so this one matters. And folks, if you are the folks who are out there trying to play shenanigans in other divisions and trying to convince people or whatever, I want you to walk outside, cross the street, and go to the plaza and touch some grass. It's just, it's wild how nutty people get, man. Like, what are we doing here? And also, folks, if a team makes a decision in alliance selection and you don't like the decision they made, don't go berate them afterwards. Alliance selection is stressful. They made their decision. Let, their decision is their decision. Maybe talk to them like a few weeks later or whatever, but like enough of this like showing up in someone's pits like, oh, you just cost so-and-so the event or you... Shut up. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Like, that just, ah, uh, bothers me. Anyone familiar with the efficient market hypothesis? Cool. Some people like economics. I like economics, folks. It's fun. Rishi, economics? There we go. There we go. Um, in an efficient market where everyone has access to all information, it's impossible to beat the market assuming everyone is acting rationally. Some people consider the stock market an efficient market because there's so much information, you can't actually get a jump on anything, you know? And some people are like, yeah, I got my Quest Trade account, I'm making all these trades or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I've got a mutual fund that has like 10,000 trades happening an hour. Like, try and keep up with that, folks. Um, is FRC an efficient market when it comes to alliance selection? So the answer is sometimes. Generally, and the answer depends on what region you're from. There are some regions which are very, very good at alliance selection, and you know, like, you're the number one seed, you know you're probably getting number 24, because everyone else will be picked before, because the market is so efficient, <coughs> Ontario. Um, there are other regions that aren't so efficient, and it is, there will be sleepers galore. I know some people who are like, yeah, we're not going to bother, like, if we're the number one seed, we're just going to rank team 16 to 24, because we're not going to get anyone else. Ooh, you better rank everyone, because sometimes it's not efficient. Success in exploiting inefficient markets comes from figuring out where irrationality exists. So it's important to look, over, look for teams that may have been overlooked. What might be overlooked in alliance selection this weekend? 
It starts with a D and ends with a fence, folks. There are so many people who are all on this double passer strategy. We'll talk about that in a second. They may be ignoring defense, and you might be able to get a really good defense bot. Here's another wild one. There are going to be more good scoring robots in a division than good defense robots. So a strategy might be use your first pick on a defense robot. That sounds stunning. Uh, if you're the number one seed, don't do that, please. But like I said, like after you get past four or five, it really clumps together. So if I'm like the number six seed, maybe I grab the best defense robot and then go offense, offense, because I know there's like at least 34, 40, or 50 great offense robots, and maybe that's the way I can get my best alliance. These are interesting things to think about. Um, how do you pick for defense, though? Because it's hard to scout. Look for the teams who have made the top teams struggle. Because when you are picking a defense robot, you're not picking them to defend the 75th ranked team in the division. You're picking them to defend the big dogs. So look for the teams who have done that before. I'm going to talk about this more on the next slide. Also, find teams who might be able to replicate what those teams did. Because there will be a lot of good defenders who will not play defense in any qualifying matches. And you've got to suss that one out. Um, this will sound weird, but typically the best defense robots are the best offense robots when they're just playing defense for the first time. Um, anyone see the Galileo Division Finals last year? Don't have to laugh like that, man. Yeah, it was fun for some people. <laughs> right there, Code Orange, congratulations. Good to see you, Gary. Um, the best defense that was played, what was last year's game called? Power up? Charged up. What was power up? Okay, there we go. It was an up. There's so many up games. There's added up. There's, oh, okay. Anyways, the best defense played all season was played by one of the three best offense robots in the world, Team 1678. Their gripper broke, and they just destroyed everyone. Actually, if their gripper, did, if their intake didn't break, they probably don't win because they would have continued to play offense and we're going to be outscored by 3,005 and 1114. It was wild that their gripper, because great driver, great drive train, great drive coach, and just destroyed everything. It was just like annihilation. 3,005 couldn't move anymore. 1114 was jammed in a corner. It was just like a tornado that just went through. It was like, oh my goodness. Rip. Um, but that's what you want to think about, about how to pick for defense. So, folks, who here wants to be on Alliance tomorrow? Or on Saturday? There you go. How many of you are convinced you're going to be playing on Saturday? Humility. I like it. That's important. There will be some very, very good teams who aren't picked. And I think it's very important for everyone here to think about what they need to do to get picked at the championship. So number one is figure out what your goals are. Do you think you're going to be a top one through three picker? Do you think you're going to be seeded four through eight? Do you think you're a first round pick, a second round pick, or a third round pick? You've got to be realistic here, folks, because you need to do the things to become these picks. So you need to demonstrate what's in demand. If you want to be picked as a defender, the best way to do it is to show that you can play defense. As much as I can tell you that 1678 is the best defender or whatever, teams are going to pick defenders who they've seen play defense. And the best way to do that is to defend a top team. So you may want to pick a match where you've, you're playing against that one top team. Try your stuff on them. And if it works, suddenly you're going to be on everyone's pick list. Um, those are the teams that people are trying to beat. Um, if you were saying, yeah, I think we're like second round, third round, you may want to consider throwing a net on your robot, folks. Uh, most teams will not do it before alliance selection, but if you can demonstrate that you can block a lot of shots early, you almost certainly are going to get picked. It's a, it's a wild thing to think about. All right, I want to talk about a match strategy here, folks. Uh, how many referees do we have in the room? Only one or two? They're all on fields right now, doing practice matches. 
Can anyone tell me how many, what the penalty for pinning is? Two points, two points. How long can you pin someone before you get a two point penalty? Five seconds. Um, you can actually pin someone for nine seconds and only get a two point penalty. Because, oh yeah. You go one, two, three, four, five, wave the flag for two points. One, two, three, four, back up. That's not a foul. If you stay for the next second, that's a tech foul, so five more points. Um, how many notes can a team score in an amplification period? Four. How many points are those notes worth? So that's 20 points, except the first one, let's throw it out because they're going to amp properly and hit the button after the shot's been fired. So their amp is starting. They have three shots to get off. So if I pin someone for nine seconds, that's a two-point penalty. But I may have stopped someone from scoring 15 points. But you're like, oh, well, what if the other robots come and score? But there are a lot of teams that are running this strategy out there this weekend called the double feeder strategy, where they have two robots at the source, which are just shooting notes down, and when there are four notes present, they fire one, they hit the amp button, and the goal for that front zone robot is to score three robots, th three robots, I think it's 2002 again, score three notes in 10 seconds. That is very hard to do. It is a lot harder to do if you're being pinned into a corner. But it is hard to pin a very good robot for nine seconds. How do you do that? You've got to practice. And you've got to show people you can do this without taking tech fouls or without getting yellow or red cards. Because the referee always has G212. Is that the rule? What's the egregious rule? G212 that they could throw out at you. Better to test that strategy in qualification matches to figure out how they're going to call it in the playoffs. It's, this game is wild, folks. There is no optimal strategy. Like, there are teams that are just going to be doing triple cyclers, just full field cycles, whatever. I saw that in, a, in the 600 matches I watched. I saw a lot of that. I saw a lot of single feed and two robots clean up, cleaning up. Then I saw those double feeding strategies. Then I saw a single feeder single cleanup, and one defender. These are so many different things. You can't do all of them. But if you can specialize in one of those roles, you increase your chances of being picked this weekend. However, there are two passing roles potentially on an alliance. So that means there is a need for a lot of passing. So it may be more important to show passing than to show cleanup. I think cleanup is harder than passing because it is really hard to do those three notes in 10 seconds. I think passing is very wasteful if you don't do it effectively because you're just spreading notes and you're just sending notes to your opponent, essentially, if you can't do that accurately. Um, I think it's important for teams to stick in their lane and just kind of do something you're good at, but you've got to figure out what that is. I think it's a very prudent for every single team to have a strategy meeting on Thursday night. You will have played five qualification matches and then figure out what your Saturday is going to be. You probably have a pretty good idea if you're going to be a picker or not, and you have a good idea of how you're looking. And talk to other teams. What do you want to see? Uh, there has never been a game this strategic in FRC, and I am so excited for this weekend because I actually do not know how this is going to play out. Uh, normally, I do. Uh, I've been pretty right over the years. I don't know what's happening this weekend. I think we could have eight different divisions with eight different strategies coming out and make for like the coolest uh, double elimination tournament ever. Um, I think we were going to see a major collision between an alliance that is doing um, double feeder and one close robot and an alliance that is throwing a defense robot out there. And I am so excited for this. This is, this is really fun. Put your hand up if you're in grade 12. You are going to have a good senior year championship, folks. Whether you're robots out there or not, it's going to be fun. Um, something I really believe in in alliance selection, if you are on alliance one, two, or three, you should be picking for consistency. You should be picking teams with low standard deviations because you already have one great robot with you. So like that second pick, go for consistency. If you were Alliance 6, 7, or 8, 
six minutes, really? Oh, okay, okay. I was like, wait a second, I lost track of time. Um, it is important, if you were going to try and beat the... If you're on Newton, folks, and you were trying to beat 254 and 1323, you're not going to do it by playing it safe. You've got to take some risks. So go for that high standard deviation robot. That robot that had that one match where they popped off for 18 and had three matches where they disconnected. You're probably not winning either way, folks. But you go, if you, your best shot at winning is to take a risk. Be bold, you know? Any Star Trek Deep Space Nine fans? Anyone? No? No? There we go. There we go. As Benjamin Sisko says, fortune favors the bold. So um, take some risks down there. Uh, match strategies. This is like the most important part of the competition, especially in this year's game. Good strategy and scouting can allow a mediocre robot to win the majority of its matches. Good strategy and a good robot are an almost unbeatable combination. It matters so much this year. You can be outgunned as an alliance, but win matches consistently if you just play the amp properly. And you make sure that you are getting three or four notes in your amp periods. You could also be one of the best scorers in the world. But if you were consistently getting amp periods where you're only getting one note in, and I've seen some great robots do that consistently, you're going to lose a lot of qualifying matches and you're not going to be picking. So this is where it comes in. To have good strategies, you need to know what you can do. So you have to be able, hey, we're back at it again. Uh, analyze and evaluate your robot's abilities. Folks, lying to yourself does not help. So you need to know what your robot is capable of. I remember the favorite team I ever talked to in a pre-match strategy session was, and I forget what year it was, but I was like, so um, what, what can you do for us this match? And they're like, um, we are good to score, do one cycle, and maybe a second. I loved it because it was honest. Half the teams at the event were only doing one or two cycles, but they were flat out honest about it. And this team ended up being a second pick of a top alliance and winning the event. Because it's like, yeah, this team knows what they can do. They can stay in their lane, and it's just great. The teams who are just like, oh, yeah, 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 we got 10 cycles per match. Dude, we got this. We got this. If anyone says, dude, we got this, they decidedly don't have it. <laughs> um, don't, but also, don't underestimate as well. If you are underestimating your abilities, there will be matches. There will be a match tomorrow where you're like, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't beat that alliance. Let's just go for the RP. Let's just try and get our 25 or 21 notes. I'll talk about 25 and 21 in a second. Um, but then there'll be a minute left. And they'll only be down by 10. And it's like, oh, shoot. Maybe if we'd been amping a bit more, we could actually be up. And the underestimating is almost as bad as overestimating. Overestimating is just annoying, but like underestimating can be damaging as well. It is probably too late to make a playbook but at least list out the possible strategies you might be playing with tomorrow and the ones that you don't want to play. Because if an alliance partner says, it's like, hey, we want to double feed. We like your shooter. We think you can feed. You can just be like, uh, yeah, we tried feeding, and every time we hit the trust, it's really awkward. But like, they might not know that. So you've got to be able to speak up for your abilities and your deficiencies. Um, oh my goodness. As you are planning strategies with your partners, um, if you are on a very good team, you have some privilege. Teams are going to defer to you. And you have to understand that teams are going to defer to you and not take advantage of that. Because all three teams on the alliance are competing together and you need to work together doing stuff you want to do. So how do you decide who does what? No freaking bullying, folks. Um, I am a firm believer that the adult drive coach is a good thing for FRC. I think there's amazing lessons that can be learned from adult drive coaches. I have also heard horror stories over the years of students. I, I mean, like, there was a one story where there was a group of students who graduated from this program 10 years ago, and they all said, hey, put your hand up if drive coach X has ever made you cry. And at this gathering, 10 different people, seven of which were women, put their hands up. Don't be that drive coach, folks. 
because we might lose adult drive coaches in this program one day because of a few jerks. And also, don't be that person because it's never good to be a jerk. Be kind. The best way to get a winning alliance is to go to your partners and say, what do you want to do this match? Because if all three teams are excited about the strategy, what do we talk about? Passion and enthusiasm. They are going to go get it and bring it home and jump to their controls right away and do it together. If you're just like, hey, we got this. You in the corner, you over there and play defense. We got this. They're not, probably not going to play defense well. You've got to get buy-in. But that buy-in comes from active communication. If you want to be one of the best drive coaches in first, the way you do that is ask your partners what they want to do. And also, not always do what you want to do, but understanding that doing what they want to do is going to make your alliance stronger. Just because you have the best robot doesn't mean that your robot should be dictating the strategy. And this is a lesson that gets missed all the time, and I think some people have this weird idea of what it means to be a leader, and they think being a leader is being the loudest person or being the bully, and that is not, not how leadership works in the 21st century. Leadership comes from empathy, and it comes from caring, and it comes from putting other people first. And if you do that, folks, you will actually win. Trust me on this one. There's some people who say that gracious professionalism doesn't work in a competitive setting. I firmly disagree with that. And that applies on the field, but when all of you go into the professional world and you're doing business negotiations and the such, some people are like, you gotta be tough. You gotta push people around. You don't have to be. Soft is not an insult. Soft is a blanket. People like blankets. I like blankets. Um, your plan for this match needs to outline what you're doing for the whole match, and there needs to be contingency plans. It is the championship. Some teams will have played 60, 70, if you're the Robonauts, like 700 matches by this point in the season. Um, robots are going to start breaking down during the playoffs on Saturday. It happens every year. Last year, there were so many matches with backup bots, two on threes, it was wild. It's going to happen, you need to have a contingency plan. So if you're running a double feed strategy and one of your feeders breaks, you need to know what you're gonna pivot to. If you're running a two plus defense strategy and one of your offense robots works, breaks, your defense robot has to be ready to switch to offense. But if you haven't talked about it before the match, they won't be ready. If you were putting a net on your robot, please don't put it in front of your shooter. Have that contingency plan there. Have that contingency plan. Uh, during matches, you have to have time limits on actions. If something is taking too long, you need to move on to the next. If you were trying to score on the amp and it's just not working and you're trying and you're trying, in the words of Ludacris, and I can't say all the words, move, get out the way, get out the way. You cannot just block the amp the whole time. Do any of you know who Ludacris is? Am I that old? Some of you? Oh my goodness. Ludacris needs to get a TikTok account, apparently. Luda? Um, but seriously, you cannot spend too much time trying to do the same thing. You've got that note jammed in you and you're trying to shake it free, just go play defense. Maybe it's not coming out. And also, do not slam into the wall to get the note out because some people get very agitated about that now. That used to be like a normal strategy and now it's like, you know, you go to McDonald's in the drive-thru, don't drive into the wall. I don't even know what's going on. Um, no, but seriously, please do not just start slamming into the walls to get rid of notes or whatever. It will damage the field. It could hurt someone. Do a spin. Do a spin. Do a spin. Do a barrel roll. Probably don't get that reference either. Contingency plans. Um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but it is not okay to throw matches. There is a rule in the manual against throwing matches. There is a rule against coercing someone to throw a match. You may think it is valuable for you to throw a match because it's going to propel someone else up in the standing who's going to pick you. That is flagrantly illegal, and it is so disrespectful of your partners who are just trying to win a match at the championship. So, not okay. Um, also, as an alliance, you have to come up with a strategy together, and most of the time the plan is to win the match. You may want to showcase something, but if you are hurting your alliance's ability to win the match and your alliance partners are not okay with it, that is almost equivalent to throwing a match. Now, if you were to tell your alliance partners, hey, we really want to play defense, we want to showcase it, and they're like, hey, that's cool, then you've made an alliance decision. 
That is one thing. But also, don't come up with a strategy and just be like, oh yeah, we're not actually gonna do that. We're gonna do our own thing or whatever. Not cool as well. This presentation is somewhat of an ethics lesson. And I think ethics are really, really important. It's something Dr. Woody Flowers talked about a lot. And if you only walk away with something from this, hopefully it's the ethics and the golden rules and that Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, coaching a match. And I'm just gonna check my time here. Oh, four minutes, four minutes, okay. Um, yeah, coaching a match is important. I can't do this in four minutes. Um, during a match, to, you gotta be able to make on-the-fly decisions. So many teams lose because they behave in a static manner. They practice the same cycles over and over again. They cannot adjust. Hey, just in general, when you're practicing at home, do not practice the same cycle over and over and over again. You will develop muscle memory, and then when you have to run different cycles. When you are practicing at home, practice from all the different driver stations. If you don't have driver stations, just move the freaking table around the room, folks. Do not only practice the red side. It is so important to practice both sides until we get a game that you don't have to do that. Um, if you fall behind, especially after autonomous mode, do not panic. The match is not over, but you may have to adjust your strategy. Uh, leave it all on the field. Give it your all. Don't be afraid of damage. But at the same time, don't take dangerous risks because your robot does have to play through this season. Um, after every match, I want you all to sit down as a drive team and talk about what went right and what went wrong. You're never gonna learn unless you talk about the things that went wrong, and you're never going to improve. So that's so, so important. Um, after a couple matches, you might wanna get rid of some strategies. That is okay. It is okay to be wrong about strategic things, and you might wanna develop some new ones as well. Uh, you often learn more in defeat than you do in victory. That applies in everything in life. The good thing is, folks, uh, 596 teams here aren't gonna win the championship, so you have a lot of room to learn, and there's so much to be learned from the championship. Yeah, these tips are like whatever. Um, preparing for the finals, folks. Yeah, these tips are whatever. Okay, we're, we're here at the end, folks. Number one, when you start your season in January for water game extraordinaire, that's not, that's not actually a water game. Read the rules, folks. Read the rules. Come up with a clear, consistent strategy for how your robot will play the game and design around it. Remember the golden rules. Scouting is the easiest way to make your team more successful. Coach is important. Remember the ethical lessons that we talked about. If you can walk away from your first career and said, hey, for X number of years, my team competed honestly, we competed with integrity, and we were empathetic and cared about people, you're champions, folks. You've won. You've gained the most important lessons. Everything else will come. Um, every game, match in first is like a high-speed game of chess. You need to have a well-thought-out plan to counter your opponent's moves. And folks, have fun. Um, if you have any questions, folks, uh, you can reach me at my email address that is listed there. You can also find it on the First Robotics Canada uh, website. Folks, if you are a high school student and you are emailing me, please, with any communications with an adult in this program, always copy another adult. If an adult is reaching out to you without another adult copied, tell someone, folks. Um, chances are they aren't doing anything weird, but let's just make people aware we can always be more safe in this program. Um, ask questions, I enjoy this stuff. The case study about um, Carter Racing and uh, NASA and the astronauts is from a book called Range by David Epstein. I highly recommend you read it, it is fascinating. And folks, um, I had an amazing professor at the University of Waterloo, his name was Larry Smith, and he would end his semester always by saying, um, I would normally wish you good luck, but um, luck is not a thing that can be controlled in any sort of way, uh, so I'm not gonna waste your time doing that. Instead, folks, I'm gonna wish you success at the championship, I'm gonna wish you success in the rest of high school, I'm gonna wish you success in your life, and for all of you, if you enjoy this presentation, and it means something to you, and it still means something to you 10 years from now or 15 years from now, shoot me a message. I love hearing those stories. Folks, I wish you success. Go kick butt at the championship, and I'll see you on Saturday, okay?